or maybe even in the church of that example. So I think we will give you the chance to talk to us. Uh, I think broadly about the topic of discussion, uh, which is the ideal title of the device, synergy and the conflict. Welcome to the session. Yeah, good morning. Good morning and greetings from Germany. I deeply regret that I cannot be in Karatina. I was looking forward very much to go there again after having visited Karatina just once very briefly a few years ago. Unfortunately, the pandemic uh, does not permit traveling these days. So uh, we had uh, in almost the last minute on Friday take the decision to cancel the the flights. Our pandemic situation in Germany is very severe. We're having uh, every day about 60,000 new incidences and about uh, almost 300 people dying every day. And with the appearance now of this new variant of the Omicron variant, uh, the restrictions are even more severe. So too bad that we are suffering still from the pandemic. A few months ago, I would have bet that the pandemic with the starting of the vaccination would be over, but this was not a good prediction. Uh, we have not really realized that the virus is very flexible and uh, that the vaccination worldwide is still not as it is supposed to be. And uh, it is particularly also our countries, the northern countries that have to be to blame for not really sharing all the vaccines in a proper way with the rest of the world. And uh, that's what we get back now, that there's new variants and there's new dangers. So we're learning from this vaccine, from this uh, pandemic, that solidarity around the world is uh, the most important good and exchange, exchange not only in knowledge and goods, but also exchange of people is what we need more than ever. And this is why I so, so uh, deeply regret that I cannot be in Kenya these days. But I still hope uh, that at least the new electronic media give us at least a little bit of uh, opportunity to share some of our ideas and to exchange across the distances. We have uh, this uh, workshop here uh, under the motto of the biodiversity. Biodiversity is a topic that uh, is important also worldwide. Biodiversity is a good that we share as mankind. The different plants, the different animals, the different ecosystem services. This is what we need all together, whether we are Kenyans or Germans or some other nations. And this is uh, also one of the reasons uh, for taking up this topic of biodiversity and I'm very glad that uh, I'm given now uh, the opportunity to share a few thoughts about biodiversity in agriculture. I try to share my screen now, and I hope that you can see my slides. Now. Can you see that slide? Is this slide visible for you? Yes. Okay. I can Bye. see it. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Yeah. Biodiversity and crop production. Biodiversity and crop production are yeah, brothers and sisters. Uh, there are synergies, but uh, as it is between brothers and sisters, there are also conflicts. And uh, this is a bit of what I would like to talk today. 
I came across um, this topic uh, more intensely a few years ago, uh, exactly in 2017, when a scientific article was published uh, by a group of uh, scientists, mainly from Germany, but also from neighboring countries. Uh, they did widespread collections of uh, insects uh, over many years, and uh, they came up uh, with the alarming news, more than 75% insect decline over the past 70, uh, 27 years in protected areas. Uh, that's not in agricultural lands, but in protected areas. And this, uh, although this, this was a very unique group of, with quite a lot of amateur scientists also working in that, this uh, paper caused a lot of uh, uh, repercussions in Germany. And so the topic of insect decline, decline of uh, species in agricultural landscapes was very, was beginning to uh, discuss, uh, was, was discussed uh, very intensely uh, since then. Well, not only since then, but uh, then since then it has been has really picked up a lot of intensity. Uh, what they are showing is uh, over almost three decades, uh, the distributions of insect biomass. They had put up traps and collected insects uh, in many areas, uh, particularly in uh, northern Germany, but also in other parts of Germany. And they have found this decline. <clears throat> um, it is a bit... Uh, Unfortunate that they have chosen the axis in a logarithmic scale, uh, but you can see uh, the uh, decline is really quite severe and quite significant. So when this discussion started, uh, what are we doing in our agricultural landscapes uh, that insects are declining so much? Uh, then the discussion in the among the German agronomy people also started and the horticulture people. And a lot of questions came up and these, some of these questions is what I would like to discuss with you today. Well, the first thing what you ask as a plant production person is what is the value of biodiversity for crop production? So in fact, are we really losing something when we're losing some insect species or we have less insects in our agricultural landscapes. The second question that is to be answered is, what is, is there really an evidence that there is a biodiversity loss? We all know that biodiversity uh, is fluctuating. It's not a constant, uh, the populations, they increase and that they decrease. So it's not a constant level of biodiversity that we have. Do we really have evidence for a biodiversity loss uh, also from other studies than just from this study that I was showing? The next question is, is agriculture and horticulture responsible for biodiversity loss or is it other factors, uh, for instance, climate change that cause this biodiversity loss? And uh, if agriculture and horticulture have something to do with this biodiversity loss. The question is, what can we do about it? And what can we do about biodiversity without jeopardizing the productivity? Yes, Brock? Yes? Are you scrolling on your slides? Pardon me? Are you scrolling? You're seeing only one slide. Yes, you see only one slide. All right, you put yeah. slide two, please. Slide two, please. And, and not in the presentation form. It is still the the uh, the small picture. Um, oh, it is oh. not. Okay. okay. What, what, what I'm sh what I'm having here is a slide which has number four. Oh no, no, we we still see only the 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 topic, the main title slide. Title oh, slide, okay. and not in the projection. That's okay. That's okay. Let's no, no, go. that's not okay. You should show this. You should, you should see the slides. But I don't know why. Why isn't why isn't it uh, 
scroll on your side. So I try it again. Can you see now the title slide again? Yes. We can see the first slide. Can you see the second slide now? Not yet. Not yet. Hmm. No, we also see your cursor a little bit frozen. Your cursor is frozen. My cursor is frozen. Uh huh. Then I stop it again and try again. Can we control from this side? All right. I have I have this button here, sharing screen, right? And, yeah. and this is what I'm pressing now. Now I'm selecting. Arrow down. Now I'm selecting the presentation. And I'm going to screen mode now. Can you see the title slide? Uh, not yet. Yeah, yeah. I, I can see the title title uh, slot, but it's not in the presentation mode. You know, it's just that on the left hand side we see all your your uh, figures, oh, yes. and then, then the you small can, center. Then you can select the small slides on your left one at a time. You select slide two, slide three. You know, all the I, way down. I don't have I don't have this panel. Uh, I have just the full screen mode with the presentation. Okay, I think then you may just have to continue. No, we, we have to fix that somehow. Otherwise, that does not work. Alternatively, you can share the presentation we present from this side. <clears throat> That would be an opportunity. What I another thing that I could try is to, I have also I've prepared this also as a, as yeah. A there you are now. I think a, you should be able to scroll down. Yes. No. Yes. We are, yeah. We are. We are good now. Is that it's in okay. full? Is that now in full screen mode? Yes, and it is scrolling up and down. You can continue. Is this full screen mode now? Yes, it is. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Thank you. Good, fine. Okay, so <clears throat> again, here this is the title slide. Uh, and this is the title slide of the study that I was referring to uh, the study from this uh, group in Krefeld in northern Germany uh, that was showing. Can you see now this graph? Is this yes, 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 we can see. Graph is visible. Okay, so everything seems to work. Yeah. And this is the slide where this decrease in biomass of insects uh, is shown over about three, not quite three decades, uh, where they have collected uh, insects in different places of Germany, particularly northern Germany. So the three, the questions that I would uh, like to discuss is, First of all, is what is the value of biodiversity for crop production? What is the evidence of biodiversity loss? So uh, can we really say that there is biodiversity loss or is that just fluctuations of populations? Third question is, uh, is agriculture or horticulture responsible for biodiversity loss? Uh, and if this is the case, and if we say we want to increase biodiversity, we want to reduce this biodiversity loss, what does that mean for productivity? Um, because there is definitely uh, a trade-off between biodiversity and productivity in agricultural landscapes. Uh, this is quite obvious. Uh, we uh, control certain populations of organisms uh, on purpose in order to 
uh, ensure good crop growth. So uh, we definitely have lower populations of weeds if we grow properly our crops. <clears throat> so uh, the last question is then, uh, how can we transform agriculture and horticulture to increase sustainability? When this discussion picked up, uh, also our National Academy of Science, the so-called Leopoldina, uh, started uh, to um, uh, write a paper and I was asked uh, to contribute to this paper. Interestingly, uh, originally only people from the biodiversity background were asked uh, to write this paper and eventually they found there is no agriculture expertise in that. Um, so how can we write about biodiversity in agricultural landscapes without having people with expertise in agriculture? And uh, then they came and asked me to participate. And uh, so uh, then this in last year, then this report uh, was written, Biodiversity and Management of Agricultural Landscapes. Well, this is how I got more and more into this topic and uh, some of the uh, experiences uh, that I made there, I would like to share with you. So first question, what is the value of biodiversity for crop production? Well, we have different kinds of biodiversity in agricultural fields. We have the crop genetic diversity, of course. We need to preserve this crop genetic diversity in order to have always sufficient gene pools to improve our plants with respect to all the needs um, of our plants. Uh, so to better adaptation to agroecological conditions, for example, but also to improve quality, to improve resistance and so forth. We have soil biodiversity. Uh, there's a lot of different organisms in the soil, as you all know, uh, they need to do the job of decomposing litter, recycling nutrients, uh, converting nitrogen into organic forms, uh, and, uh, and so forth. So um, they are responsible for soil structure and, and so forth. So this part of biodiversity is definitely uh, very important in agricultural systems. We as human beings create diversity on farm by implementing crop rotations by growing plant species mixtures, intercropping and so forth. Uh, we use um, systems to, to have permanent soil cover in order to protect the, the soil, but also in order to improve the soil fertility. We uh, have grassland systems, uh, sometimes grassland and pasture systems alternating with crop systems. Um, that means uh, we can in include also other organisms like livestock into our agricultural systems. Um, so we have more opportunities then for increasing uh, the rotation diversity. We can start perennial cultivation of grasslands increased nutrient availability. We have predators and parasites, um, uh, pests uh, that we usually try to reduce uh, with agronomic means, but also chemically. Uh, this is a kind of biodiversity uh, that uh, is usually called uh, plant protection. And uh, this biodiversity is also something that we need to consider. We want to employ the beneficial uh, insects and uh, like to shift the uh, population balance uh, to the benefit of these parasites and predators and uh, therefore increase the natural control of pests and uh, diseases. Then uh, we have uh, bedding, not bedding my microorganisms, um, uh, organisms uh, that colonize habitats so that pathogens cannot establish, so preventive plant protection, so to speak. And we have also essential, particularly in fruit production, but also in many other fields of horticulture, pollinators. Uh, many of our crops <clears throat> are insect pollinated. So we need to preserve this kind of biodiversity also. 
So for us as plant production people, the question is how much biodiversity do we need? So which populations, uh, which organisms, and what population sizes? This is a question that the people working with biodiversity, the biologists working with biodiversity, usually do not ask uh, for them. More bio, the more biodiversity, the better. For us as agronomists, as horticulturalists, uh, we have to wonder uh, about the kind of populations that we want uh, and the kind of populations that we do not want. And we have to wonder about population sizes that might be critical. But is there an evidence of biodiversity loss, uh, as this study that I was showing initially seems to indicate? Well, we all have heard about species uh, that uh, have been prevalent in the past, uh, declining substantially. Two examples of that is that we have a steep population decrease of, for instance, on the left-hand side here, the Rocky Mountain locust uh, that has been an organism which has caused a lot of uh, devastation in agricultural fields. Uh, I still remember when I was a master student in the United States, seeing locusts uh, uh, devastating whole experiments uh, within uh, yeah, minutes rather than hours. Uh, so apparently sufficient control of these organisms has almost caused them uh, to, be, to, to go is extinct. And on the right hand side, you see these beautiful butterflies, uh, the North American monarch, also a very popular butterfly, which is also on the red list, also under heavy pressure. Here in Germany, the partridges, an animal uh, which occurs particularly in cultivated landscapes, uh, is under severe pressure. Partridges live from weeds and uh, the more efficient, uh, the more effective the weed control is, the less uh, they have as the food source. The uh, birds in agricultural landscapes are declining. Uh, that has been shown for many decades now. So um, there are some uh, birds uh, that are also on the red list now in agricultural landscapes. Uh, these birds that are very typical for, for agricultural landscapes in particular. And the fact uh, that we have changes in plant popula in uh, bird populations uh, in several ecosystems um, does not uh, um, prevent us from seeing that uh, it is particularly the agricultural landscapes which have the most severe, the strongest decline. Um, here you see on the left hand side agricultural landscapes with this uh, orange. Uh, this is the strong decline being much stronger than uh, the decline in birds, uh, for instance, in woodlands or in settlements. So also an indication there is particularly something going on in agricultural landscapes. There have been now several studies uh, that look into these uh, relationships uh, in many parts of the world. Interestingly, it's uh, particularly Europe, the United States uh, also, but uh, not very much uh, has been done in other parts of the world, uh, also you know, particularly in the South. And so the picture that is dominating the literature is mainly uh, based on findings in Europe and the United States. So what has, what has been found there? Um, population trends for insects. Uh, here, for example, different insect groups. Um, you see on the left-hand side, uh, different orders that are decreasing. Uh, these are the red bars. Uh, some of them are stable, these are the 
the gray parts uh, of the bars and uh, there's also a few species uh, that are increasing but it's only only very few you see particularly uh, locusts uh, the order uh, the uh, the orthoptera uh, they are particularly under pressure uh, this is from a, a study in uh, uh, um, or from from a data set uh, which is worldwide and on the right hand side you see a data set which is from the united kingdom but you see similar things uh, percentage increases of more than 40 more than 30 from the bottom up and here you see it's uh, the the beetles as well as the flies as well as the butterflies and the dragonflies here on the right hand side they all are under severe decrease there are also studies that uh, show that there is an increase in insects uh, and this is mainly uh, in aquatic systems uh, but here again you see on the terrestrial systems uh, there's also a decrease um, a decrease in abundance and in biomass on the upper side. There is also um, a decrease which is going more or less through all continents uh, and uh, through all kinds of ecosystems. So there is uh, a severe trend not only uh, in agricultural systems but also in protected systems like natural reserves and so forth. However, in agricultural systems, you see here also a bit of a trend, the darker brown and the, dar the, the darker brown here uh, shows these are unprotected agricultural areas uh, that uh, show an even more severe decline than the protected areas. And this takes place all across the world, uh, but particularly here in Europe, in the terrestrial ecosystems uh, over the last years. Can you see my cursor? Uh, over the last years, there has been a significant uh, change, uh, deeply accelerating or severely accelerating over the past few years. So there is a biodiversity loss and uh, it seems that this biodiversity loss is more severe in agricultural systems than it is in other ecosystems. But what is the evidence that agriculture and horticulture are responsible for this biodiversity loss? Well, there are several reasons for biodiversity loss. Um, I hope you can see that, probably not uh, read all the text, uh, but <clears throat> I can show you. There's one reason for biodiversity loss is uh, that species, new species are introduced and uh, they uh, provide competition uh, to existing species. Uh, so many of these invasive species are extinct existing species. Pollution and urbanization is certainly also one of the drivers of biodiversity decline. Uh, improved fertilization, improved nitrification uh, means that we have less and less ecosystems with low nutrient supply and all the species adapted to these low nutrient supply ecosystems are going uh, or at least are in danger. There is uh, fires, uh, there is other natural catastrophes, storms, but certainly the global warming is also one of the drivers of biodiversity decline. Global warming, which leads to more extreme climatic conditions, to droughts, uh, to storms, <clears throat> uh, is certainly one of the drivers. But it is also human activities like deforestation, uh, the use of insecticides, uh, also the intensification of agricultural production. So all these things, they have to do, of course, with agriculture and horticulture. 
and the four major drivers um, uh, that you can see here, uh, one of them is the change in habitats. Um, this has a lot to do with clearing natural landscapes. Uh, we, uh, in the past, in Europe had more small scale fields with hedgerows in between the fields uh, over the past decades. A lot of that has been cleared so that there is much less uh, uh, ref, uh, much much less room for uh, insects also to um, to uh, find cover and to hibernate in natural zones. So uh, habitat change definitely uh, seems to be the largest driver uh, of, of uh, decline. So all the agricultural structure of the agricultural um, ecosystems um, is uh, definitely responsible for that. Then pollution, uh, uh, pollution particularly, uh, the use of chemicals uh, is uh, the second largest uh, driver. Uh, biological traits and climate change range next to that. But here on this slide, you see that it's particularly intensive agriculture, uh, pesticides, uh, pesticide use, uh, uh, also a little bit the use of fertilizers, which seem to be associated with this reduction in biodiversity. The use of pesticides uh, seems to play next to the change in the structure of the agricultural landscape, uh, the major role. We see uh, that over the past years, um, that uh, uh, the toxicity to some organism groups has decreased uh, to the fish, to the mammals, to the birds. Uh, so uh, that is part of the good news. But on the other side, uh, for other organism groups, uh, um, for the aquatic invertebrates, for pollinators, for terrestrial arthropods, for terrestrial plants and aquatic plants, the uh, uh, toxicity level of our pesticides has increased. Uh, so we have more toxicity to these organisms uh, over the years than we had uh, some decades ago. The change in agricultural landscapes that I that I mentioned uh, can be illustrated here very nicely. This is a part of German's history, as you know, until about uh, a little more than 30 years ago, Germany was divided into East Germany and West Germany. And between these two countries, there was the so-called Iron Curtain. Uh, this was a, a strip, a landscape strip. Uh, that was impassable. Uh, there were mines, landmines, uh, there were fences. Um, so also for the animals, it was not so easy, at least for the larger animals, it was not so easy to go from east to west or vice versa. But we also had different uh, economic systems. Uh, we had the private system of agriculture in West Germany, as you can see here, with small scale fields. And we had uh, in East Germany, more large-scale fields. Um, formerly, these were also small farmers, but there was what they called the collectivation. Uh, they made collectives out of the small farmers, and uh, this was also associated with creating larger areas for production, larger fields. So you can clearly see uh, the amount of field margins uh, is a lot higher in the West than it is here in the East. And some years uh, ago, um, there was made uh, a study what this means. Well, th this kind of, uh, of uh, differences has, main has been maintained. So still the fields in East Germany are much larger than the fields in West Germany. So ecologists have now analyzed what that means for the biodiversity, for the species richness in these different systems. Uh, <clears throat> and you can see here uh, this uh, orange line. This is East Germany, so the larger fields, uh, the species richness, which is 
much lower than the species richness in these West German fields, which is this uh, orange line with the with the uh, with the circles. Um, they have also looked uh, what the effect of uh, a, um, a farming, uh, which is more uh, following the principles of organic farming, what the effects are of that. And uh, you can also see that there is an increase in species richness compared uh, to the conventional in both on both sides. But again, the small scale structure has higher species richness than the large scale structure, but uh, organic farms have a higher species richness in both fields, in both sides than the conventional fields have. So what is the relationship between the landscape structure and functions that are important also for agriculture? We have here, uh, what is called landscape simplification. So what is the effect of landscape simplification on the richness of species and how is the richness of species related to functions like pest control or pollination purposes? Well, we see here that a more simplified landscape reduces the richness. Uh, this is clearly the case. This has to do with uh, the species that are involved in pest control as well as for the species that are involved in pollination. But we see on the other side, a higher species richness is positively related to the services of pest control and to pollination. So we have, we have these uh, effects uh, that uh, more species richness means better pest control, better pollination, but on the other side, it is clear that landscape simplification works against that. So from that point of view, we have a reason as agri agriculturalists uh, to have a more diverse landscape so that we have more species, that we have more services from the natural predators in terms of pest control, and that we have more pollination services for our fruits. Landscape composition plays a major role for pest control, for pollination, but also uh, they have also looked what uh, landscape composition means for yield. Um, for pest control, it is <clears throat> uh, particularly the edge density. That means the uh, uh, length of edges a, in a particular area which plays a major role. Uh, you can see what is yellow here means very high effects. So the highest pest control we have with the higher edge densities and particularly in areas where we have a relatively small proportion of arable fields. So there it is higher than if we have higher proportions of arable fields. In other words, uh, if our landscape is composed from uh, more fields, which is either not arable or natural, then we have higher likelihood of uh, uh, beneficial insects doing their job towards pest control. For pollination services, uh, the proportion of agricultural fields does not play such a major role. It is mainly also the edge density. So small scale fields, uh, apparently with more grass strips between the fields, they cause more pollinators uh, to, or they attract more pollinators and they allow more pollinators to do their job. With yield, uh, there is not so much uh, of a difference as, you, as we can see here. So yields uh, vary over uh, the arable, the proportion of arable fields and the edge densities more or less in the same way. So we should have a reason to have more diverse agricultural landscapes, uh, that we have less pesticide use, more uh, organic farming in order to improve our biodiversity. Well, we can see 
uh, that land use intensification uh, has to do with species richness. Uh, so the higher the land, inten uh, the land use it, uh, intensification is, the less species uh, we have. Um, when we look at organic farms, uh, we see, uh, so this was a study where uh, in several parts, uh, particularly in Southern Germany and Bavaria, um, the uh, different plant species were counted and uh, they looked whether organic farms had more or less than conventional farms. Uh, in terms of uh, production habitats, uh, we can see uh, that indeed organic farms have more of these species, at least in uh, four of these locations, this was significant. In non-production habitats like uh, natural uh, biotopes, uh, there was not a very big difference between the different. And also the um, on the farm level, uh, only in one location, there was a significant, significant significantly higher uh, biodiversity uh, in organic farms compared to uh, conventional farms. How can that be explained? <clears throat> At the field level, we have apparently more effects of organic farming on biodiversity than we have on the farm level. Apparently, on the, on the farm level, things seem to balance each other. So on the farm level, it is not so much the case whether it is organic or conventional. On the farm level, uh, it is apparently more um, a question what the agricultural landscape looks like, how the agricultural structure looks like. Nevertheless, uh, in general, we can find uh, uh, that there is a tendency or and with some organisms uh, a very clear picture that there is a higher biodiversity in organic farms than in conventional farms. Uh, this is particularly true for the arable flora, which is uh, essentially uh, the weeds. Of course, they have a much higher incidence in in uh, organic agriculture than in conventional agriculture. But uh, also as far as birds, uh, insects, bees, butterflies, beetles, spiders is concerned, there is at least a tendency, sometimes not really significant, but at least a tendency that organic farming has uh, uh, beneficial effects. So this is a good thing. <clears throat> On the other side, organic farming is known to be less productive. And uh, this is, uh, I think, one of the central trade-offs between biodiversity and agricultural production. What does it mean if we have less productive fields? Uh, well, in order to produce the same amount of output, this would simply mean that we would have to need, uh, have to use more area. And using more agricultural area uh, goes at the expense of natural areas. And that means uh, that the biodiversity is, is under pressure in these other areas. The fact that uh, there is a, a clear difference in productivity between organic and conventional agriculture is shown here. This is in Germany. Uh, this is in, uh, these are figures from Germany and this is also in German, uh, but uh, I can say you uh, can explain you the major uh, aspects of that. Uh, this is for um, cereals, the productivity of cereals in organic farms compared to conventional is only about 48%, as you can see here. Uh, in uh, open field production of vegetables. Uh, the difference is not that big, uh, but still uh, organic farms produce only about 77% of the yield of conventional farms. In potatoes, it's 71.5%. In apples, 76%. So we can say it's on, we have definitely uh, one quarter to one half lower yields. Um, so since cereals is the major 
staple crop. Um, uh, this means uh, if we would convert our agriculture from conventional into organic, we would uh, need almost twice as many fields. Um, so uh, this difference is not that big in other parts of the world. Uh, there is a clear uh, relationship of the relative organic farming comp uh, compared to conventional farming. Uh, which is dependent on the yield level. So the lower the yield level, the smaller is the difference. So particularly in high performing agriculture, these differences are, are quite big. And we can see uh, that this relationship between yield and biodiversity is indeed uh, measurable. Uh, we can see we have here the yield, the crop yields on the x-axis and the number of certain uh, species on the y-axis. And we can see here uh, bumblebees, solitary bees, butterflies, hoverflies, uh, arthropods living in the soil. There's, they are all negatively related to yield. So they have a higher incidence when the yields are lower and uh, as more as, as, as the uh, farm is more and the field is more productive, the biodiversity uh, decreases. So we have this negative relationship, but still the question is, can we transform our agriculture, which is apparently not conventional and uh, not, not, um, not sustainable in the conventional form? Uh, how can we con transform our agriculture to, in order to increase uh, the sustainability? Uh, another um, to increase the sustainability that means uh, uh, what can we do to um, combine both uh, high productivity and to not lose uh, and, and to uh, increase our biodiversity in the agricultural fields there are in Germany and several this is another slide in German there are several activities. One of them is here in Lower Saxony. This is where Hanover lies. And uh, uh, you can see here there's a number of different measures which are taken uh, that starts uh, from strips al along, uh, creating strips along uh, waterways uh, uh, up to a conversion of farming into uh, uh, organic farming, uh, which is uh, targeted here in Lower Germany to come up to 15% by the year of 2030. Uh, there's also a decrease in the use of uh, pesticides. Uh, there is uh, uh, the plan to uh, have more uh, connections in between natural biotopes in order to create better refuge uh, for uh, insects and birds. And um, all this has been agreed upon by the farmers on the one side and the environmentalists on the other side. So uh, this has been implemented uh, last year and we're looking forward how all this works. So let me conclude. Uh, I think uh, there is enough evidence to see that there is a biodiversity decline. There is reasons to do something about it. Uh, we have a particular severe biodiversity decline in agricultural landscapes. Uh, major drivers are pesticide use, field size and clearing of natural vegetation in agricultural landscapes. Something has to be done about that. That means we have to find ways to reduce our pesticides. Uh, by producing more resistant plants, by having more improved crop rotations with less species, uh, 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 crop species occurring in the same fields. Uh, we have uh, to remodel our agricultural landscapes in order to create more uh, reserves for our natural plant species. The question is, is still, uh, uh, whether this biodiversity affects the ecosystem services that are responsible for agricultural production. 
Uh, there are some indications for that, that, uh, for instance, uh, that uh, the biodiversity decline is related to uh, increased pest occurrence, but uh, there's no real good data around so far. Um, we have to uh, also ask uh, why biodiversity, which biodiversity we need in order to produce enough food. So which are the species that we need, which are the species uh, where we can also tolerate lower prevalences. And we still have to collect experience which transformations in landscape structure and agricultural practices are necessary. And uh, these projects like the one that I have just briefly indicated in Lower Saxony will collect some experience on that. So with these few remarks, I would like to conclude and uh, like to thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, uh, please don't uh, hesitate to ask them. I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion. Thank you. A very good presentation. Uh, I think uh, we can welcome questions from the side table. Is this the only option? I, I, I'm very sorry. There, there's a lot of echo in. I can hardly hear anything that is said in the hall. You can't hear me. I'm. I'm sorry. I can. I can barely understand you because there's a lot of echo in your lecture hall. <clears throat> Maybe the chat can be used for questions. There's even one question now in the chat. Okay, yeah, I think probably this is, yeah, Lucy. Hello, Lucy. This is Louise speaking. And uh, I was welcoming questions from the high table and they don't seem to have any. So okay, okay if you have questions from the high table, please. On how we can. They don't seem to have uh, any response. So I will provide direction from here. Thank you very much. So I have I have questions here in the chat. I think that's probably a good a good means of asking questions, huh? So I think the participants are well guided. I want to welcome Kegabi. I see Kegabi has her hand up. And Lucy on the chat. So the questions are on the chat, Pro. Yes, I see. Uh, that's very good. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah, I can. I can read. So you can Do we expect a correlation between species richness above and below ground? like in organic farming systems. I think we can clearly say, yes, uh, organic farming systems seem to have a higher species richness above and below ground. Um, some of the figures that I, that I showed uh, indicate that uh, already, but uh, I mean, it is very clear, the uh, below ground species richness uh, is in organic farming also a lot more important since there has to be a, a done a lot more conversion of organic substances in into minerals. So there has to be a, a lot more breakdown of uh, the organic fertilizers, uh, which is of course a good food source for the species below ground. And um, the, the um, um, uh, fact that there is no pesticide application in the above ground also means uh, we have less species decline, we have more species, uh, a higher species richness in the above ground. The second question is how do water conservation strategies influence biodiversity? Water conservation strategies uh, like reduced tillage, for example, can mean uh, that we have a change in the biodiversity in, uh, for instance, uh, the, uh, the upper parts of the soil. We have 
uh, less aeration uh, when we reduce our tillage, uh, and that means there's lot there's less uh, activity um, of the um, organisms that. Uh, uh, decompose soil organic matter. On the other side, uh, if we reduce uh, the soil tillage, we have much better protection of the earthworms. And the earthworms are, of course, very important, not only for the decomposition of soil organic matter, but also for creating vertical holes. And these vertical holes are important when we have heavy rainfall. Uh, so we have much less soil erosion uh, when we have good activities of uh, vertical, vertically dwelling uh, rainworms. So in other words, uh, we get a, uh, probably not more uh, biological activity, but we get a more uh, useful biological activity if we re reduce our soil tillage in order to conserve water. Or do you have any other uh, aspects of water conservation in mind? Which species are much likely to be influenced? Uh, it is particularly the earthworms, uh, which are very much influenced. We can see qu quite some differences if we reduce our soil tillage. Uh, we have a lot higher um, occurrences of rainworms. Uh, particularly also because these rainworms, they feed on what they find on the soil surface. Uh, so if we reduce the tillage, if we have uh, mulch systems, for example, in order to conserve water, we have uh, a much better, richer food source for the rainworms. And th this means we have also more rainworm activity, uh, which creates then these vertical holes, which is very important for water infiltration, particularly when we have heavy rainfalls. So in, in that as, aspect, uh, I think uh, this goes very much into a, a positive direction. So I can't see any other questions in the chat. Yes, thank you very much. I think if there are others, they can only be directed to you on the same chat and possibly you can also respond there, but we really appreciate your time and uh, your good presentation. Uh, I see another question here. How will predation be controlled amongst species? Well, I think that's that's part of the natural dynamics uh, that there is predation uh, amongst species. Of course, you can you can somehow inactivate predators, uh, but uh, the question is, why do you really want that? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, all the nutrient cycles depend upon predation, uh, so uh, there is. Uh, in principle, no point to control predation unless you have specific, a specific objective. Uh, then, of course, uh, you have to take specific measures. Okay, I think these seem to be the questions. Huh? We appreciate and uh, we are moving on to the next session now. Well, thank you very much. It was my pleasure. I hope you will be with us for the other presentations later. We yes, I, 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 would love, I, would, I would love to, but, but uh, could you try to reduce the echo because it is very, very difficult for our side to understand. Okay. To understand what's going on. So if we can improve that technically, I would also very, very much like to uh, um, participate in the discussions. Uh, I have reserved all day for for the meeting.
Okay, since I don't hear anything from you, thank you very much again for your attention and the questions. And I'm looking forward to, to the next presentations in the meeting. Thank you very much.